Mary, it's a pleasure having you. Everybody, I'm Charles Shapiro, President of World Affairs Council. Thanks for joining us today. Mary Street is our guest today. She's the Senior Vice President of U.S. Communications and External Affairs for BP. Um, and she agreed to talk to us about the energy industry. So, Mary, welcome. And tell, tell everybody where you are to begin with. I mean, you're not, that well, does not look like um, your office. No, no. Uh, thank you, Charles, and thanks to the World Affairs Council there in Atlanta. Um, we are, um, my husband Clyde, who some of you probably know, my husband Clyde and I are up in Vermont, um, uh, normally in, in D.C., um, but up in Vermont, in Rochester, Vermont, which is central Vermont, um, about 60 miles south of Burlington. Cool. That's great. That's great. Well, it's great to have you here. Tell, tell us a little bit about BP. Um, you know, oil companies are changed. They went through this whole merger acquisition period. Um, you've got four times as many U.S. employees as U.K. employees, even though BP used to stand for British Petroleum. Um, who are y'all? Are you, are you a British company, an American company? What's up? Well, I would say we're a, we're a global company. We've been around uh, uh, about 110 years when you look at all the heritage companies. But as you mentioned, we have a huge footprint in the U.S. and a long history in the U.S., um, including some of our heritage companies in the U.S., Amoco, Arco, Sohio, so a lot of familiar names. Um, a third of our revenue currently comes from uh, the U.S., 40% uh, of our shares are held in the U.S. So um, for me, in, in my job, when I'm, I'm talking to stakeholders, government officials, policymakers in the U.S., I, I play up our, our U.S. roots because we have them. They're long and, uh, and, and deep. Um, and we've been, over the past decade, the largest energy investor in the U.S. So, so we have a significant presence here, but, but a global company. Great, great. Um, so, so oil made the news a couple of weeks ago when prices went negative. Mm. What does that mean? I mean, y'all giving oil away? Can I go to the, the BP <laughs> station and fill it up for free? I mean, what's, what does that mean? What does it mean to you? What does it mean for your business plan? Well, um, uh, I would say it's, it's interesting because when we, when we um, talked about uh, me coming on and doing this, I think it was the day after the price was something like negative four. That's the right. WTI or West Texas Intermediary, which is like the um, American uh, price. Um, but uh, I would say we are in an unprecedented time in the industry, really for two reasons. It's, it's a volatile industry and we've seen supply shocks um, for years and years. I joined the company in, in 2014. Uh, I think it was in April of 2014 and the price of oil was um, above $100 a barrel. Sure. Uh, by the end of that, by the end of 2014, I think it was in the, um, it had gotten down to 17 and then back into 20. But, but the, the oil, the industry is, is, is pretty volatile. Um, but what's unprecedented now is we have the supply shock, the recent supply shock with the OPEC um, an OPEC plus countries not being able to agree on, on a curtailment, but coupled with the demand side shock from COVID. Um, people just, I mean, as we all know, people aren't driving, people aren't flying. Um, you know, the, the economies around the world uh, have, have slowed down enormously. So the combination of those two things are unprecedented and caused, um, you know, oil is a, is a commodity like soybeans and, and others It's traded globally. But this West Texas intermediary, we're trading um, and traders uh, have contracts. And so these contracts expire monthly. And I think today they're, today's the day they expire for June. And so these um, people have to sell those contracts. And because of the oversupply, um, there's no place to put that oil. And so mm -hmm. for a period of time last month, um, prices went negative because people were having to pay. Mostly these traders or people that take these certain hedging positions were having to pay to have people uh, take those contracts. So it was a bit of an anomaly, but it speaks to the unprecedented, unprecedented time that we're in. Um, but I think today 
the Brent and WTI prices, or at least when I looked last, it's, it's pretty volatile, so it could have changed, but, you know, in the 30s. So yes, you go from I, I, a I checked four right before 30s. the call. Yeah, it's a, it was okay. a 34 right before the call. So, okay. so, so it was, you know, it was up 9% yesterday, 10%. I mean, it's like, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, so how, you know, if I'm, if I'm selling clothes, I know what I can sell them for. I know what the price is going to be, right? I mean, how, how, do, how do you do a business where the price is up and down like that for um, the, the raw material that y'all transform in, in, the, right. in the gasoline in the pump? Well, and, and it's uh, interesting because we are an integrated um, energy company or oil and gas company. We do more than oil and gas. Um, I'll talk about that in a minute. But an integrated company means we have an upstream business, and that's the E&P extraction and production of, of oil and, and gas, bringing it out of the ground. And then we have the refining, which is the downstream, and that is taking the crude and, and processing it into gasoline, jet fuel, um, chemicals, all sorts of things. So in, in, when you think about it, it's in some ways it's a natural hedge. When the price fluctuates and goes uh, way up, you know, the, the upstream side of the business uh, does well. When it goes way down, we've got the downstream uh, refining part of the business that does well. So there's a bit of a natural hedge, but, but to, in, in this world, and it start, we're seeing demand start to come back, but the right. supply and demand shock is, is something that is different and, and unprecedented. Yeah, I saw that uh, China is starting refineries again, and the Chinese consumption right. is, is up. So that's got to be some, mm -hmm. some re relief for you, even if you're not selling to China, but just because you're dealing with a commodity that's got a global price. Right. Well, we have operations in China as well. We have petrochemicals and, and other uh, operations there. And, and we have started opening those offices back up again. Um, and, and, but it, it, it gives you a signal about, about you know, where the world is going. And, and now, you know, we can't control COVID. We all, I mean, none of us can. And it, it is pretty unpredictable. But it's a signal of how things could move in the future. And I think that's, that's why you're seeing the, you know, in addition to the demand is coming back because people are driving more, but it's also a confidence that we can get through this and, and looking at, at China and that model and where we'll be and, you know, will it be six months um, or longer? Don't know. Okay, so your CEO is Bernard Looney, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, Bernard, Bernard, Bernard Looney. it's the Irish course. pronunciation. Okay, uh -huh. <laughs> Bernard Looney. And he talks about energy with purpose and has set a goal for BP of net zero by 2050, which, which is 30 years away. Mm -hmm. How do you do that? I and mean, first of all, what does net zero mean? It means no emissions from the company. It means no carbon. I mean, you're a hydrocarbons company. I mean, among other things. I mean, what, well, first of all, what does net zero mean and how in the world do you get there? Right. Well, I, I will say, just stepping back, Bernard um, was announced last fall coming in as our, our new CEO um, and stepped into the role in uh, February. And in February, announced a new purpose and ambition for BP. Um, and and it, it is to be net zero by 2050 or sooner and to help the world uh, get to net zero. And mm -hmm. so what... I mean, I think your question, what, what in the heck is net zero and how does a hydrocarbon company or why does a company, you know, traditional oil and gas company, why would you do that or, or say that? Um, I think first and foremost, if you, you know, we are looking at, um, at the future and uh, what do you see and where do you think the world's going? And, and um, we have to we have to make decisions about strategy and investment. Um, and we see real opportunity in the energy transition um, and, and think that the, that's the direction the world is moving. So net zero by 2050 or some version of that is uh, what, you know, the UN in, in Paris, the Paris Climate Agreements, what, what countries signed on to, um, and, and we're seeing more and more countries and uh, sign on to that. And so if you look ahead, you have to say, 
is my company, you know, set up for that? Um, the other piece of all of this is what um, I think probably a lot of people here have heard about the ESG investors, um, environment, sustainability, governance, and, mm -hmm. and the shareholders and investors in companies like BP and other uh, energy companies are demanding, you know, that we show how we're going to be resilient in all these different scenarios, the Paris scenario, but they're also demanding cleaner, cheaper energy, as well as returns. Um, so it's sort of, well, how do you give the same returns and, uh, and deliver this energy? And so what Bernard said in February is that this is what we will do. We'll be net zero by 2050. Um, and so I think your question was, does that mean you won't sell hydrocarbons? Well, we do think there will be hydrocarbons in the mix in 2050, but um, our, our ambition is to be net zero. And so by net zero, uh, it means how do you take the carbon out of, of your um, system? And there's different ways to do that. There's technologies that exist now. Um, you know, there's, there will be portfolio changes. We will, we will be shifting more to alternative energies. We will still be in the oil and gas business in 2050, but we will decarbonize. There's carbon capture, sequestration, there's um, blue hydrogen, there's uh, offsets, uh, but you can't do it all through offsets. And, and uh, we in the U.S., we're already the um, leading uh, supplier of renewable natural gas. So things like biogas, um, and making jet fuel. We partnered with a company called Fulcrum out in California that makes uh, jet fuel out of garbage. So there's a lot of different ways you can get there. We've got 30 years, but you've got you to start making those investments now. And we said in February, Bernard said in February that he would come back to the market um, this fall with more specifics um, because we've set the ambition, we've set the you know, target, and now we need to come back and provide some details about how we're going to get there. And so that's is coming in the fall. Is this serious or is this just, you know, greenwash to satisfy the climate change folks? No, it is, uh, it is serious. And we see real business opportunity um, in this. And that's one, um, in addition to the net zero ambition that we set for in February, we also um, pledged to reorganize the company because the model that I described before, the upstream downstream model, we're really not um, organized the right way to take advantage of these opportunities. So um, we're in the process of reorganizing. But one thing, when you look at, at cities and regions and many companies outside of the energy sector are making all sorts of sustainability pledges and you know, they don't necessarily want to go to, well, I'll go to a wind company and see how much wind I can, you know, acquire sure. for power, perhaps, or a solar company, and then, you know, another company for gasoline. We think, given our, our size, our scale, and our history, um, and our current portfolio, we have wind, we have solar, that we can come into cities like Atlanta, or Chicago, or other places in the U.S. and around the world, and offer them you know, be a partner and help them reach their own uh, net zero or lower carbon uh, emissions targets. So to, to become an energy company and, and not a hydrocarbons company. Right, well, an, an energy company and all of, and all of that. And, and, you know, there, do we think, I mean, that, this is the question that Bernard, you know, gets pushed on a lot is, will you be in the hydrocarbon business in, in 2050? Yes, the world will still need hydrocarbons, but probably less of them, um, but our goal is to look for the opportunity in this energy transition and be a, an early mover in that space. That's interesting. Let, let, let me stop for a minute. I should have at the beginning. If people have questions, and I hope they've got mm -hmm. loads of questions right now, um, please send them to Fernanda Lucchini, who will, uh, via the chat function on Zoom, and um, Fernanda is great at combining similar questions, shortening questions, and omitting the angry questions because you know there always uh -oh. people are <laughs> ang angry at me, angry at BP, you know, angry because of the station on the corner. 
Um, so y'all, please, uh, if you've got questions, please send them to Fernanda. Fernanda will edit them and send them on to me so I can ask, ask Mary. Um, I, I saw something this past week where about the price for producing solar energy has dropped so quickly. Uh, and mm -hmm. it's dropped more quickly than even the experts in the field had anticipated. Um, is that part of the mix you're talking about? Is that part of the way you get to net zero? It, it absolutely is. Um, BP uh, is a 50% owner and it was at the time when we got into it, I think two years ago, um, of uh, light source it's now called light source bp and um and in the solar development space and and light source because of the partnership with bp and and the scale that we bring and and um is is now in the u.s and has seven projects uh uh moving forward in the mm -hmm. u.s so we see huge opportunities in um in solar in wind and and other uh technologies and we have a whole ventures business that's investing in new technologies that you know aren't commercially at scale yet, but uh, um, or still very much in the development stage because it's you know it's going to be a combination of all of these things. I think that help both um, you know help the world get to net zero. Um, and so there's not a one there's not one answer. It's not going to be only wind, only solar. Um, it will likely be a combination. Well, plus I, I, I assume there's be some breakthrough technologies that we don't even know about now. Exactly. That, that by 2050 right. will right. have a huge impact on this. Um, We've got, it's, it, I was going to say at BP and, and until I joined six years ago, I didn't realize a company like BP and um, I think we have 7,500 engineers. We've got 2,000 scientists. We've got people that all they do is look at and work on technology um, development. So it, it's a fascinating business to be in the energy space and, and looking at all these new and emerging technologies. And for me, it's just trying to keep up with, you know, what's the difference between blue hydrogen and green hydrogen? Um, don't, don't ask me that question. People can Google it. But it's a different, you know, different methods of producing hydrogen, which is much cleaner, and then you know, depending on how you make it, where do you, if, if it's through natural gas, there's a CO2 stream that you've got to uh, deal with. But it's, it's really a fascinating um, space to be working. This, this year is the 10th anniversary of the Deepwater Horizon spill, um, mm -hmm. which, you know, just dominated the news for almost a year. Is, is it, it, and that was your operation, BP's operation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How much did that affect the corporate culture of BP? I and mean, would, would, would uh, Mr. Looney be talking about net zero if it had not been for Deepwater Horizon? Well, let me sort of take that in two parts. How much did it change the corporate culture? I think it, um, it forever changed the company. Um, you know, 11 people lost their lives. Uh, it was a terrible disaster and um, it, it did change the company forever because we can't forget that and safety has to be first and foremost um, always. Uh, and I think, you know, in looking at the, t the 10 year anniversary, there pro but for COVID, there would have been a lot more, um, you know, positive, negative, what's happened to the Gulf of Mexico um, mm -hmm. and the region, um, what was, you know, all of, all of the different uh, studies that have been done. But I think um, it's, it forever changed uh, BP. Um, but I don't think it necessarily is connected to the 2050 net zero goals. Um, it, uh, it does tell you though that, you know, I think what, what it tells me is that we're in a dangerous business. I mean, there's, there are risks and, and so safety has to be uh, front and center at all times and everything, everything we do. Of course. Um, and another, I mean, I'm asking stuff, I, you know, as I start researching to do this, I mean, all these things mm -hmm. start popping up. Can you talk about drilling in the Arctic? Um, the House of Representatives keeps passing bills saying, U.S. House Representatives saying no drilling in, in the Arctic. 
Um, it, while the administration is relaxing um, the restrictions on drilling on the North Slope of Alaska. Um, what, what is this about? I mean, how, how, how should we understand this? Is this just a political back and forth or is there really something more serious behind it? You know, I think there are people on all sides of this that have important points to make. So it, it, it's not just political because, you know, people that live up there um, on the North Slope and, and in Alaska have a huge stake in this and, and have very probably differing opinions on, on it. Um, we, BP, uh, announced last year that we were selling um, our North Slope uh, production and, and BP it was the, has been a major producer on the North Slope um, really since it, it began. Um, so for me, luckily, and, and I don't have to personally be in that, um, that debate right now on uh, getting, you know, do you go in or do you not go in? But what I will say is that every project now um, has to compete against every pro other project globally. So you've got to look at the cost of production in, um, in the Arctic versus the Permian in West Texas, Gulf of Mexico, Egypt, Russia, around the world. And so when, when big companies are looking at investing, they're looking at all of those costs that go into it, including legal, regulatory, other costs. Um, and so, uh, you know, every project has to compete um, globally. And um, so I think it's, it, it'll be interesting. The, it's, it's more than just politics. There's a real economic question. Is, is that going to be, even if it does get opened up, you know, um, what would be the price of producing and uh, does it make sense? And I think that's kind of, and can it be done safely? Um, at the end of the day, I think probably everybody in, on all sides of this would say, if it's going to be done, it has to be done safely. It's in a pristine area and people want to uh, keep it that way. So, the, A lot of the Western Hemisphere oil is, is super heavy crude. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I was posted in Venezuela and that's what they're producing. Mexico produces, the, the onshore oil is very heavy. Mm -hmm. Canada is producing, I mean, very heavy crude in Alberta. Is, is, is that still, you talk about projects have to be able to compete. Is, is that kind of crude that's hard to get out of the ground, that's hard to pump, that's hard to ship, is that, will it remain competitive? I think if there's a question, and, and this goes to the carbon, perhaps the carbon intensity of, and the life cycle carbon intensity of, of getting a product out of the ground um, and getting it to a refinery and then the refining and all of that. So you have to kind of look at all of that. And I think more and more um, those externalities are being put priced in on, on the front end. And I mentioned earlier the ESG investors, the in, investors that are focused on sort of the environmental impact. So e even if you think you can get it cheaper, um, you know, on today's prices or next year's the i think there is also this added element what will your shareholders say is mm -hmm. that i mean and that goes to um in in certain areas in alaska or other areas that might be sensitive uh or or really intensive carbon intensive processing so there's a lot of different factors i think price is is a pretty good indicator but um more and more i think shareholders are demanding cleaner energy and you could say well any oil is that really clean but there are um there are probably different you know for for that group of investors uh probably different tolerances for different types of oil when, when the business roundtable issued everybody online business roundtables the organization of the most of the largest companies in the united states um I think it was last fall when they issued their new sort of guidelines for businesses and how mm -hmm. businesses should operate. They didn't talk about shareholders. They talked about stakeholders. Um, mm -hmm. who, who, who are BP's stakeholders? 
I mean, do y'all think that way or is that, or, I mean, obviously you've got to, you know, you've got your, your, every quarter you, you, you report to your shareholders, not to stakeholders. Right. Well, so we, how, first how do y'all sort that out? We, we um, are members of the business round table and our, our CEO uh, last year, Bob Dudley uh, signed on to that as part of the business round table and um, Bernard is now part of the business roundtable and has reaffirmed it. So, I mean, yes, I mean, we look at our, it is, it really has to do with what is the corporate purpose. And I think um, for us, there is a broader um, corporate purpose than just your shareholders and shareholder return. It is um, more and more, we're looked on as what are we doing for society? and what good are we doing for society? And, uh, and I think, you know, as a corporate citizen, and that's, that's the way of the future, in my view, and I think our company's view, uh, and, and more and more people, including, you know, shareholders, and, but society at large is, is asking more of corporations. Okay, so questions are coming in now. Thank you all very much. Okay. Um, the first one is from John Allen, who I, I have an old friend named John Allen. I hope that's him. Um, and he asked, and I think he's a shareholder as well as a stakeholder, because mm -hmm. he's asking a shareholder question. That is, um, will the, your dividends be cut in the near future if prices remain <laughs> under, under $40? <laughs> well, I'm not going to make news here <laughs> for John, but <laughs> I will tell you what. Um, Bernard has said, um, and, and when he's talked about this publicly, is that we'll review that every, every quarter um, with our board. Um, but, you know, the dividend, and so many of our shareholders are uh, retirees and, and depend upon the dividend, and, and so it is an important um, marker, but we're going to continue to review that quarterly. As, uh, as John probably knows, Shell cut their dividend um, last quarter. And most of the other majors did not, but uh, but we will be, you know, reviewing that um, as we do every quarter and and making making um, good decisions for our shareholders and and for the long term future of the company. Of course, okay, okay, <laughs> that, that, was a, that was a good dodge. All right, so okay, thanks. <laughs> here, 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 here's a question about emerging markets in Asia and Africa. Um, when you talk about net zero, it's one thing in the developed world, but it's quite another thing in the developing world, um, mm -hmm. which, you know, they, they rightly say, I mean, the way that uh, Europe and North America developed was by enormous pollution at one point, and then has mm -hmm. reached a certain level of economic development, you've been able to reduce that pollution. So the, in the Asian and African economies, say, wait, wait, what about us? You know, we don't want to be poor all our lives. So um, the question is, are they going to lag in reaching net, net zero, um, your operations in, in, mm -hmm. in Asia, Africa, Middle East, Latin America? Um, I think we are, you know, this is a global commitment that we've made, but it's amazing. Um, I mean, and, and just the question is, is a good one. I mean, we've talked about it in the past as a dual challenge. How do you provide you know, energy for the world and, and many in the developing world, I mean, you need, you need reliable energy and clean water to lift your economies up. And, and so, you know, they, and if they've got those resources, they should be able to, you know, use those. I mean, that's the, the argument on one side and then, you know, clean energy and, uh, uh, I mean, are, is it really, are they, are they, juxtaposed like that or can you have have both but for BP Angola is a, a great example in our operations there we were able to and this relates to methane but we were able to um, in that operation you know make some changes and reduce the methane emissions by over 60 percent so mm -hmm. and you know and it and it's good for the the country that we're operating in and it's uh, and cost wise, it wasn't, you know, I think a lot of people have assumptions this is going to be incredibly costly 
it's not it's a changing your mindset and how do you how do you do this in a responsible way and you know in some cases there'll be increased cost in other cases in our business in the u.s we've um methane again is another it's a greenhouse gas but a much more potent greenhouse gas than co2 but but um we found by using technology drones and other technology that the cost per well of monitoring and fixing those is is less than a hundred dollars per well so some wow. some people have said oh it's going to be thousands and millions and millions of dollars to control for methane well with with technologies and sort of changing your mindset you i think you can do this and that's what we found and that goes into our thinking in terms of yes we can do this on net zero we can do it globally okay and just so everybody knows the methane is when, when you see an oil well, you, you see that flare at the top, and that's the methane mm -hmm. being burned off, right? And so what you're doing right. is, is eliminating that. Yes, I mean, methane, and, and you think of uh, ga natural gas is mm -hmm. methane um, in its sort of simplest terms. And in, there's different reasons you flare. Uh, sometimes it's safety to, to release if there's uh, too much pressure. But in some places in the U.S., because natural gas is so cheap and there's no infrastructure there, um, some, some people are just burning that off so they can get the oil out. Because usually mm. in these shale formations, you're getting oil and natural gas. And I think that's the, that's the big red flag, if you will, just burning it off like that. And that's putting enormous amounts of methane in in the atmosphere, which is um, is much more potent greenhouse gas than CO2. Great. Uh, uh, thank you for elucidating my, my, my bad <laughs> attempt to explain. <laughs> That's actually very helpful. <laughs> how, how, how does BP grow if you're doing, if you're at net zero? I mean, are those two, is, are net zero and corporate growth uh, sort of counter goals that work against each other? Is it via acquisitions no. of alternative no. energy portfolios? I mean, how do you how do you do that? Well, I think it's. I mean, there's a lots of different ways. I, I certainly don't want to get in front of our our CEO, but what what we have said is that our you know the the capex that we put into our traditional oil and gas that's probably going to shrink, and that will probably be reinvested in other areas, and whether that's you know, acquiring other companies or building new businesses. I think it's probably a combination of, of all of those things. Can you talk about Russia for a little bit? I mean, that's, I mean, there's, there's, there's so many issues around Russia mm -hmm. and energy. I mean, first of all, Russia is not a member of OPEC, um, even though they are one of the largest producers of, of oil and gas in the world. Is there any chance they would? I mean, this whole thing was sparked off by Russia and OPEC feuding over what the over re production reductions. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, it would just seem to be in their own self interest to have done so. Well, it, a couple of just observations. So I think they call it now um, OPEC plus, and that usually is that's referring to OPEC plus Russia because they have such a huge. Uh, impact on this and and um, so I'm not sure if it's does Russia join OPEC but um, can these countries agree on you know production curtailment which they have and I think everyone's watching to see if they they follow through with that but the other piece that we've learned from this is um, how much does OPEC or OPEC plus matter when the US um, and has such a an ability to um, impact uh, supply around the world. There's so much in the U.S. and um, and in especially onshore in the lower 48 and uh, in the Permian, that can typically come on and off pretty quickly depending on the price. And so um, the question I think that our economists internally and externally that people are looking at is OPEC or OPEC plus, what price do they want oil to sit at? And they could probably control that up to a point, but they'll want it 
maybe just at a price that it makes it not economic for all these U.S. onshore folks to get back in and flood the market. Okay, I, and then there's a whole bunch of sort of national security issues associated with Russia, mm -hmm. where uh, a number of European countries are buying gas from Russia, and Russia's been able, certainly in Ukraine, to influence their politics by cranking the uh, amount of gas up and down and, and the price that they charge. We're trying to what, stop uh, Germany from buying more gas from Russia. Can, mm -hmm. I mean, what's this, I mean, and, you, and you're, you've got operations in Russia. I mean, how does all that work? Well, I, I will say BP is a um, uh, almost 20% shareholder in Rosneft, which is one of the largest oil companies um, in in Russia. We're a shareholder though, we're not operating um, those assets, um, but we do have, have board seats. But as I started off saying we're a global company, um, we have um, operations or um, holdings in, in many parts of the world, um, Russia being one of them, and an important part of our business. Uh, uh, we also have pipelines um, in, in a big production in Azerbaijan. And there's pipelines that take the oil and gas from the Caspian into Europe. And one of those pipelines, it's called the Southern Corridor Pipeline that um, is set to be completed this year, knock on wood, but, um, and it, it takes gas from the Caspian through Georgia, um, Azerbaijan, Georgia, Turkey, um, Albania, Greece, and then into Italy. And um, so we always joke. Sir, so, so, so this is Russia. That's the point. Yeah, it misses Russia, but um, it, it misses a, a couple of other countries too. But it, it, Russia is a partner in this. Uh, one of um, Russia's uh, oil companies is a partner, and Iran is a partner in this. Because of the areas the pipeline goes, they're important partners in this project. And so one of the issues that, um, you know, predates me being at the company for six years, but these for the U.S. are, are really strategic, important geopolitical pipelines. It's taking gas and it's non-Russian gas um, into Europe. And so even with, even though Russia and Iran are partners in this project in different parts of the project, um, the U.S., because of sanctions and other things, has um, has has doesn't matter. Democrat, Republican administrations has given exemptions from certain sanctions um, to BP um, and and the other companies operating because it's so strategically important to um, get that gas and to diversify supply into Europe. So it's. Um, it's pretty interesting. We think sometimes the politics in Washington, D.C. are, are uh, tough. Boy, in that part of the world, um, you know, when you think of that many different governments and uh, involved, those politics get pretty interesting as well. Yeah, I, I mean, yes. One of the things that strikes me is a super challenge for um, extractive industries, and particularly for the oil and gas industry, is the huge lag time between the time you say, oh, maybe, maybe there's some oil or gas in this particular block of land that you've got the right to explore. And you know, just in some cases, decades till you can actually develop that, find mm -hmm. out where, where this stuff is that's underground, you know, right. figure out the technology to get it out, and then fi figure out how you, how you move that stuff from the from where it is to where you, where the consumers are. I mean, that's a huge challenge well, for you. And that's why talking about 2050 right now, um, some people say, oh, that's, you know, 30 years in the future. Well, the typical investments, as you point out, are 30 plus year investments in Azerbaijan, in the Gulf of Mexico, in Alaska those are billions and billions of dollars. And so you have to be making decisions now about what 2040 and 2050 look, lo look, at, um, look like. So it is, um, you're right. And um, you know, one of the questions I think the market and others are asking uh, is, you know, do those 
multi-billion dollar investments make sense given the availability of shale oil and shale ga gas that um, are potentially much cheaper you know, in West Texas and other, otherwise to get into, do you need to make those huge multi-year um, investments? That's tough. Okay, I've got a final question from the audience here, and that is, how does BP forecast and manage such huge fluctuations in the oil price? Well, I think um, we expect, um, you know, volatility, and we're set up and organized that way. We have a huge, huge trading operation um, globally. Uh, and so, you know, for me, before I came to BP, I was in the energy um, the power generation business in another company that had a, a big trading operation. And so I, I, I learned more about that, but it's, it's, it's a way to hedge against risk and volatility. And, um, and the problem is if you bet wrong, you know, you, usually those are big, big bets, but um, it's truly about the trading and the hedging. And you have to, just like someone was asking me the other day about um, airlines and how are the airlines, you know, shouldn't tickets be much cheaper now because of um, because jet fuel is so cheap and um, and I said well I think most of these airlines about you know 80% of their fuel they've hedged because they need for business planning purpose they need to know what their fuel costs so they may have hedged three years out now I don't know what their contracts say in terms of if it goes above or below a certain price but I, I think the hedging sort of helps manage um, the volatility um, but also having, um, you know, diversified portfolio does as well. Very street. Thank you so much. This has been great. I've enjoyed this conversation. I, I hope all the people watching have as well. This has been terrific. Thank you so much for taking your time and spending it with us. Now, hang on for just a minute. I got to do some advertising for the World Affairs Council on what we've got coming up. Just everybody pay attention here for a second. Don't drop off yet. Uh, tomorrow at noon, we've got a program with former XM chair Fred Hockberg talking about his book, Trade is Not a Four-Letter Word. Clyde Tuggle, whom you know, Mary, is going to introduce Fred, uh, who's a personal friend of his. And Craig Lesser is going to be, at, who we all know, is the former Georgia Commissioner of uh, Economic Development is going to be the interviewer. So that, that should be a lot of fun, y'all. Please tune in tomorrow, register in advance. It, delighted to have everybody on Friday. We've got a program, Mastering Leadership in Times of Crisis. It's actually a, a, the, the intro part of a course. Uh, it's for members only. It's with Dorier Underwood Consulting. Um, so join the World Affairs Council, participate this on Friday. Next week on Tuesday, we've got Jim Reed, the president of YKK Corporation of America. On uh, Wednesday, we've got Arlette Guthrie, the VP of Human Resources for the Home Depot, talking about the workforce of the future and how COVID is going to, has changed, will change that. And then on Thursday, the 28th, we've got Stacey Abrams, um, which is going to be great. And she's talking about her article, which ran in Foreign Affairs Magazine last, last week, I want to say, maybe in the week before last. Um, where she talks about American leadership in the world. So this is gonna be great. Y'all join the World Affairs Council, join our programs. Um, we're working with Governor Brian Kemp's staff on a date for him to join us. I've been saying this for a while now. If any of y'all have any influence with the governor, please let me know because I need to get him to yes. Uh, join the World Affairs Council, make a donation, sponsor a program. If you got a great idea for a speaker, please let me know. Mary Street, thank you once again. This has been great. I wish you all the best. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.